This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is sponsored by GardenCourses.com. GardenCourses.com offers online horticultural training for those looking to develop their own home gardens. The latest course to be added is Create Your Garden Sanctuary. You can go to GardenCourses.com to find out more. This week I'm speaking to Mark Lawrence. For decades, Mark has been at the vanguard of sustainable and ecologically sensitive landscape and garden design. He currently specialises in coastal plants and gardens. And in this interview, we cover what makes a coastal garden, which types of plants fare well by the coast, and whether these gardens can be havens for wildlife. Mark starts by talking about a career that has often seen him at the forefront of the sustainability movement. I've been in the landscape trade since the late 70s. So I I started off um, working for an aquatic landscaper, a guy called Anthony Archer Wills, who... Uh, in his day, was quite quite well known. Um, very eccentric guy. Um, he was the first person to use beautiful liners to make ponds and things. So quite forward thinking. And uh, I developed a love of landscape. When this is when I was nineteen, um, working for him, um, learned all about the art of placing rocks and and uh, aquatics and nursery work. Uh, so a wide range of stuff and. And that was my introduction to horticulture from a, a casual job. It became a lifelong obsession, really. Um, I went on from that to I, pretty much immediately after that, I started working for myself and, and uh, accumulating equipment and got more and more interested in trees. Um, ended up working with some really good tree surgeons who taught me how to climb and use chainsaws safely and so on. So I, I Became an arborist for a number of years and did some really interesting sort of projects doing that. And then seesaw between arboriculture, landscape, man- managing firms for people. And then in the mid 80s, or slightly, uh, 87, I think it was actually, um, set up as a landscape designer. And in those days, there weren't that many of us around. So I just put a little advert out in the back of the RHS magazine and uh, started work um so it's all been very informal build up a very hands-on learning experience so, so you know as a as a route for me other than it's not not being college-based or academic or anything so i just learned everything um on the job as it were over the years and it probably couldn't get away with that these days but <laughs> <laughs> oh i don't know yeah well that's that's how i worked and uh, for me for me, it suited me. And uh, by the time I wanted to go and do an, an arboricultural training course, I was so busy, I was employing trained climbers instead. So, um, you know, for example. So I never got back in, into the college. So it, it, it helped, I think, that my, my father was a landscape, a landscape architect and interior designer. Um, and my mother was an artist, so I got a natural ability to draw. So that that kind of pulled me over to the design side. I've got naturally a design-led mind, um, and uh, I, you know, I just went through it. Always very sustainably based, very much dealing with sort of ecological aspects. Didn't like, wouldn't use weed killers or you know, it was organic. So I was doing sustainability stuff before anyone was even really using the word in terms of landscape. Work and that led me to in early 2000s, uh, 2005, six or something. Uh, I got contacted by London School of Economics, who wanted a sustainability feasibility study for their London site, and they couldn't find anyone who was talking sustainability apart from me. Um, and that led me on into looking at urban greening, um, and from urban greening, I got really. Uh, obsessed with the idea of living walls so in 2007 i set up a living wall company um with a business partner and that that company was biotecture who are still going and are very successful um and we we developed our own in a patented living wall system 
using hydroponics and I worked through the company out in Chicago, Dubai, um, you know, in parts of Europe. And that was really um, getting into the sort of urban green side and the green infrastructure and looking at how to put greenery into urban spaces other than in gardens. Uh, and wanted to sort of do something that was addressing bigger issues of, you know, air quality, you know, urban heat islands, you know, all these sorts of, you know, building insulation, um, all these sorts of ecological aspects of, you know, green infrastructure. I left biotechnology and resumed work on my own. I was always still a, myself as a consultant, as Mark Lawrence designed, but that was very much on the back burner. And then I set up uh, another living wall company on my own called Vitology because I, I just, be, being a stubborn sort of bloke, I like to do things my own way. And, you know, um, <laughs> so uh, um, I ran Vitology. Vitology has, um, has, is now after seven years and doing some quite interesting projects, again, working abroad. My last living wall went up in Iceland in Reykjavik. Um, and uh, now we it got to the point where the, the market for living walls is really big, professional, very competitive on price. And I was just a small guy and wanted to get back to something more intimate and more connected with plants. So, so uh, living down on the coast here, I've always done coastal gardens because, you know, that's what what's here. And, and um, we're on the coastal plain and... Uh, so and I absolutely love them. So I started growing plants. We have a greenhouse, which is a legacy from our green wall days, of a, an acre of glass. And uh, we started growing plants. And that's this year we focused that down. I mean, obviously we got hit and like everybody with COVID, and you know it was a in a transition phase anyway for us. So that made it, you know that also forced a big rethink and and yeah so we've come out of that and we're now developing a really interesting range of plants some native some exotic some for gardens some for coastal sort of you know vegetated shingles or sand dune plants and and of course i'm designing as well um gardens but but i only take on a few gardens at a time because the nursery at the moment is consuming most of my my time um so it's all focused right now down onto um yeah down onto the coast and the plants that grow by the sea (laughs) it might sound like a bit of a daft question but what is a coastal garden i mean how far can you be from the sea and still be classified as being a coastal garden well it's no it's a good question um and i don't think there are any hard and fast rules about this um i i haven't seen any classification of it but I, but i i look at it, um that a coastal garden is any garden whose climate is influenced by the sea um so you know the coast where i am down in sussex we're on the coastal plains so, so south of the downs is is very flat it's all alluvial deposits from um you know from erosion and from um rivers so it's very flat land I, you know i think where we are with maybe 18 metres or something above sea level. So although although we personally are five miles or so away from the sea, it's um, it's still the, we still get the, you get the winds coming across from the sea. Um, They're not intensively salt laden where we are, um, whereas of course they are on the coast. But so I I tend to break it down into different zones. And I, I, so I say coastal regions are, any any garden that is affected by the sea, who's got a more moderate climate because of the sea, maybe it's milder, it maybe it's wetter, um, maybe it's sunnier or drier. You know, it could be any of those things that are moderated by its sort of coastal general location. I, I, anything that's right on the shore seafront or the shorefront, I, I tend to call a beach garden, although of course they're not all on beaches. So a shorefront garden is, is something different again and that is a garden that has the full impact of um you know the the sea and, and has to deal very directly with you know very strong very salt laden winds and um and, and all the conditions that go with that um so uh, so yeah I, 
but you know, it, eventually, when we've got the nursery really sorted, we'll group our plants by zones, so that you know we'll have sort of vegetated shingle beach zones or sand dune plant type zone, zones, um, and then you'll go into uh, you know more general coastal plantings, shelter belt trees and things so you know there's all there's so many different ways of breaking it up but I, I try to keep it simple really i think it's better if you keep it simple um and but so coastal is general um general influence beach or um shoreline is, is direct influence if you like mm. So obviously you've got lots of different conditions in terms of where the roots are going. Uh, you mentioned the salt laden winds. Is that the main challenge for plants that are in a coastal garden? Yeah, I think I think the salt the salt I mean anywhere can be windy, but you know, if you're windy up on moorlands, you're not going to have you've got the wind to deal with, uh, but you're not going to have salt laden unless it's moorland that's very close to the sea, of course. Um but by and large the the, the the primary thing is is salt salt burn salt tolerance um some of the plants we grow you know might be halophytes that's plants that are growing sort of um saturated um soils um such as you'd get on mud flats and estuaries and things um uh but mo most of the plants will have to tolerate a level of salt um on their foliage uh, and uh, a lot of the more ornamental plants will be the sort of more Mediterranean things that are used to growing, um, you know, in you know, in sort of rocky hillsides and things around the uh, Mediterranean areas of the world. Um, and the Mediterranean, of course, is a zone; it's not just a place. Uh, so there are, was it five different zones around the world that are Mediterranean, um, not just the Mediterranean basin. Um, but salt is. Yes, there's a dot. It, it can. The closer you get to the sea, the more dominant the salt factor is on what plants will survive. And is there a rule of thumb uh, in terms of what plants do well? Obviously, you've mentioned the Mediterranean ones. Um, or is there, you know, could you sort of be a bit more general and say, actually, we know this group of plants won't work there? Um, well, you know, most, it's not all always automatically Mediterranean for a start. Um, for example, there's a, there are sections of the coast along here which are, are on very heavy clay and get very waterlogged and right on the, on the shorefront. So I, I've worked on gardens where they're on a heavy clay and then they've got a shingle bank in front of them and the other side is the beach. Um, and yet they are heavy waterlogged soils when, in the winter and and water will tend to accumulate in them. So, you know, if you put a put your standard Mediterranean shrubs into that sort of soil, they're not going to survive because they, um, you know, the more classic Mediterranean plants are generally growing in pretty free draining conditions. So, the conditions do vary, and of course, there are huge swathes of coast around the world which are not in Mediterranean zones, and they all have their own plants. Um, that are adapted to that environment. So, um, it, you know, the, the range of plants are generally, um, I suppose they're generally less frost tolerant because you get less frosts, of course, on the, um, on the, on the coastal zones. Um, that's not true everywhere. Again, you know, I mean, obviously, you know, many areas of coast can, Get bitterly cold, but um, uh, you know, for for down in the south of the UK, um, you know, you you're not having to deal with uh heavy frosts on in the sort of coastal regions, so that that can mean that you can grow plants that wouldn't you wouldn't tolerate. If we go north of the downs from here, we got the we got the coastal strip, and then we have got the chalk downs, and then the other side you're into the weald, which is you know clay and and um, green sand and things, and of course. You know, it, you can get much heavier frost just 10 miles inland from here, which some of the coastal plants wouldn't cope with. Um, in, you know, so yes, there are definitely plants. Um, there are more plants that you can grow here that you can't grow inland, I suppose, than the other way around. Yeah. Mm. 
That's interesting because um, you kind of assume they'd be quite harsh conditions. Um, but I was wondering as well if you if you were, for example, doing a beachfront garden, uh, would you tend to use more plants that occur naturally in that area rather than ornamentals or does that not necessarily follow that they'll be tougher? Um, I, I like, you know, I, I definitely look at that because I look at, look at the wider context um, and I would marry in um, many of the, local native beach plants but that doesn't mean you i wouldn't mix ornamentals in with it but you again you would zone it so it, i mean if the garden was going straight down onto a beach you, you know and if it was a pebble beach you know you could use plants that are used to vegetated shingles on the um like sea kale or um you know that sort of thing the, the cp there's all sorts of different things that will grow but um but you can also mix natives in with that as well. And I'll, get, I'll give you a, a good example of that is um, we have an, a, an area, uh, we have Pagham Harbour down near us, and that's a sort of, you know, an SSFI. And it's um, a very beautiful place. And it's got a, a strip of um, vegetated shingle beach. But it's got houses, that, lots of little chalet houses that uh, people live in and that have been there since I don't know when. Um, and they back... They front straight onto the shingle beach. So in that area around there, there is this whole mix of garden escape plants and natives. And it's absolutely fantastic. It's like a dream. I, I love it, it, especially at this time of year when everything's in flower. And you, you walk down there and you see all the sort of vegetated shingle natives mingled with um, garden escapes um, that are growing very happily out there. You know, you get curry plants and... But, um, you know all sorts of things it's a, you know that are seeded out into the shingle from gardens and have naturalized there so i'm supplying or you know i'm, I'm discussing a, pro a muni municipal project for a, um, a council where you know they're putting in uh, developing uh, vegetated shingle areas and beach front and and um, they want to keep all the planting very native um and they don't want to mix in you know, non-natives, but I, I think I can understand that uh, approach, and that's the traditional approach, but I think with climate change, one of the most interesting factors is that, you know, the beach gardens are on are the vanguard, if you like, of um, climate change, and that in that they're having to deal with some of the most extreme changes of weather and, and uh, you know, rising sea levels and all, all the things we see um, the, you know, happening, and I think we need to adapt our planting to what will grow. And not, I, I don't believe there's such a thing as native. There's just whatever happens to be in a region at any one uh, point in time. Um, so I, th I think there's a huge scope for being adaptive in our planting in gardens and looking at. Um, at the same time, you have to you have to have a bit of an eye on not putting in things that are really aggressively invasive. Um, but there's plenty of things that naturalize and, you know, are, you know, appear to be pretty beneficial to the wildlife and environment um, by doing so. So can coastal gardens be rich in wildlife? I mean, you kind of think that they tend to be quite extreme environments and they may, may not be so hospitable to things like insects. But is, is that a misconception? I think so. Um, yeah, you know, uh, I. I was again. I was walking down on the same beach I've been mentioning um, recently, and there was, you know, vipers bug loss in flower, smothered in bees. Um, you, you know, the, there's the um, uh, centranthus in flower. Again, you know, and all all these things. I mean, you know, they wouldn't be there flowering if they didn't get pollinated. Um, so. No, they're they're very rich areas, and of course, where you've got sand, you you know you've got the potential for, um, you know, the kind of, you know, solitary bees that and bees that sort of you know, burrow into sand as habitat. Um, I think they can. I think they're extremely rich environments. Um, and the thing with climates and zones is wherever you get the overlap of different zones, you get an increase in biodiversity because you get some things from one zone overlapping with some things from another zone. Uh, and of course, the biggest, you know, contrast 
you could imagine is between land and sea in that respect. I, I wondered if, um, I think for me, I always think trees struggle in a coastal garden, probably of all the plants. Um, do you have any kind of trees that you like to use over and again because they're such good survivors? I wondered if maybe you could just give one or two examples. Well, yeah, tree, tr trees are tricky. Um, it depends on the on context of the garden, of course. And with trees, it's kind of long term. So again, these days we have to think about climate adaptation. So if there's you know a reasonable size that where you can plant trees that will get to any kind of maturity, and of course on a coast you're not going to, on you know if you're right on the seafront you're not going to get trees growing to the sort of sizes that they grow in land because they you know the the wind sees to that um, so they're going to grow to a more uh, stunted size but what, one of my favourite sort of southern invaders from the Mediterranean is Quercus ilex the you know um, holm oak um, which has naturalised, it's been planted for years um, along the coast, but isn't in places as naturalised. And that that's a plant that you know is going to probably adapt pretty well to future conditions. Of course, we've got you know we've got standards like uh, poplar alba and poplar tremula, quaking aspen is pretty good on coasts. Um, there's there's all the Mediterranean pines, uh, Pinus nigra, Pioneer radiata. Olives, of course, olive trees. Tamarisk is another one, which is debatable whether you call it a tree or a shrub. But uh, again, uh, uh, Tamarisk uh, gallica is naturalised in parts of the south and southwest. So, what else? I mean, you know, there's um, obviously there's, there's arbutus, um, really good. There's some acacias, acacia delibata, uh, and the the plant I'm playing with at the moment um, is eucalyptus. Uh, a number of, a lot of eucalyptus are, are coastal in their origins, not all of them. And a lot of them are also very good at being coppiced. So by coppiced, I mean obviously pruned down to the ground every few years. So they'll take hard pruning. Um, and I, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't put eucalyptus into a garden on the beach and not prune it because they are quite vulnerable to some of them are quite vulnerable to wind throw but if you prune them they down to the ground every five or ten years or whatever then that you get amazing multi-stemmed trees um very coastal tolerant so yeah so we're playing with some of those and uh Gladitia possibly is another one but uh, to be honest there's, there's a whole range of trees i think that i that i myself have yet to explore and uh want to grow i mean you you get obviously you get your native willows and things that grow down onto the sea and even birch although i don't think birch on the seafront and, and full exp exposure do very well though you do see them and so uh, yeah uh, sorbus uh, intermediate is uh, another one yeah so you've got quite a, a quite a wide choice really yeah um i mean i think sometimes it's difficult obviously people can go and visit many beautiful gardens that are more that further inland um can you think of a really well-designed, good example of a coastal garden that people might be able to visit. I mean, I don't know whether that would be, you know, in the southeast or anywhere in, in England would be fine. Uh, well, uh, do you know, it's, it's funny. I, I, I don't spend a lot of time going around other gardens and, they, you know, I think I should, but I always seem to be too busy. But um, I, I suppose that the, the most iconic, Beach garden, of course, is Derek Jarman's, and that's the garden that probably kicked it off as, a, as the idea that you, you know you can um, you can garden in the most extreme of environments. I believe um, Beth Chateau was influenced a lot by him. So that is a, is a very classic garden. Um, yeah. Oh, now I'm going to struggle. <laughs> I know it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. I don't. I don't really visit them. I mean, uh, I, I. What I do is when I go to coastal areas, I always just go to the coast and look at what's growing. And you see lots of amazing gardens, but I, d I don't tend to walk around public gardens. Um, it's, yeah, it's an interesting one. Yeah. I'm, I'm mm. probably not going to be much use on that one. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, like I say, I I have found a bit a dearth of information about these things, um, and it, kind of in a similar vein. Can you recommend any websites or books that 
people where people could find out more? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, there's fractions of information everywhere. Um, but I, I've not found a good definitive book that, um, you know, works for the UK. Uh, there, there's some, there's a few publications. I'm just trying to think of some. Um, but again, I, I, I find when I, when I'm looking for information, there is a, there is a dearth of, it. you know, there's not, there's just, there's not a go-to reference book or, or website or, or anything. Um, you know, no, no. It's... So, so you need to write one, and then in the meantime, time people need to follow you on social media and watch what you're doing and visit your nursery, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I, I will say my my nursery is trade only. Okay. Uh, um, okay, good to know. It's for designers and landscapers, and it's for jobs that are specified. I don't have the the size or the scope or the resources to be public. Uh, I don't think I've got the energy either, to be honest. <laughs> 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 yeah. So yeah. So we're 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 a nursery primarily for other designers and people in the trades, or or for municipal, you know, municipalities, or um, you know. So again, just to mention that project in, in Essex, I'm working both with a municipality and with a civil engineering company who are doing the you know shorefront works. Um, so those those are my kind of clients. Okay. Uh, well, cool. I, I mean, I've come to the end of my questions. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention before I let you go? I, I, I would put a call out to um, the, the designers and professionals that I've mentioned to to contact me and let me know what it is that they want. Um, because, in, you know, we're right at this early stage of um, putting together, uh, you know, the plants that we supply and. I'm always really interested to talk to people, um, you know, and see where the gaps are. Um, I think it's a fantastic sort of um, and very exciting sort of area that we're delving into. I think, it, you know, and it's got a lot of scope. Um, so, yeah, just really interested to hear from people. Thank you, Mark. If you'd like to get in touch with Mark, you can find his details in the show notes. Thank you for listening. If you have come across any good resources for those growing in a coastal location, please do let me know. Thanks as well to GardenCourses.com for sponsoring this episode. And just when I thought we'd busted the myth that worms couldn't reproduce from body parts, here's Dr Bedford talking about one that can. Living within dark, damp environments, such as leaf litter and under logs or plant pots, are a rather unique group of invertebrates that belong to a taxonomic phylum called the platyhelminths. Platyhelminths are more commonly known to us as flatworms and can easily be recognised by their elongated, mucus-covered bodies which are completely smooth and have no appendages or tentacles. They also have no body cavity and so absorb oxygen and nutrients through their skin. Basic, primitive creatures, flatworms are assumed to be the oldest living ancestors of all bilateral animals, which are those that have a right and a left side, and are thought to have remained unchanged in appearance for over 500 million years. In Britain, we have about four native species of flatworm, although there's at least another 15 non-native species that have so far been inadvertently introduced with the importation of pot plants. But it was back in the 60s when invasive flatworms were first reported in Britain, when the New Zealand flatworm, a dark brown species that grew up to eight inches long, was being found in our gardens. Its appearance caused great concern, since it was a rapidly reproducing flatworm and known for its voracious predation of the ecologically important earthworms. However, attempts to contain and eradicate the New Zealand flatworm failed and so it became established and spread, mainly throughout the northern parts of Britain. Then a few years later, the Australian flatworm appeared, a smaller orange-coloured predator of earthworms, which also became established, but this time spread across mainly the southern counties of England and Wales. Despite the appearance of other invasive flatworms in Britain, the New Zealand and Australian species remain our greatest concern 
and continue to spread to new locations. And so it's not uncommon to find at least one of these species within our gardens, under a plant pot or in a shady, damp area amongst the borders, where they'll rapidly reproduce and remain active throughout the year. And although their impact on the native earthworm population might not be noticeable, it could be quite severe. So if we do find flatworms in our garden, the current advice is to take a photo or collect a specimen and then report it to the British Non-Native Secretariat, the details for whom can be found online. However, controlling an infestation of flatworm is not easy though, since there are no chemical products available. And for those who might have a manual method in mind, it might be worth knowing that flatworms can reproduce by fission, which means sections of their bodies can grow back into new individuals. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. Please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast.